Last month, in full view of the television cameras, John Connolly auctioned off the accumulated possessions of a lifetime. The three-term governor of Texas, the man they used to call Big John, said he was going public because he didn't want anyone to think bankruptcy had broken him. And you kind of wonder what it would take to break John Connolly, since he has ridden a turbulent destiny up and down so many times before. From the day he was wounded in the shooting that killed John Kennedy, to his struggle for the presidency, which was always just out of his reach. Connolly, now 71 years old, said after the auction, we could come down to the ranch for a tour and a talk about what was and what might have been. The tour began when he drove us a few miles down the road to the place where he grew up in poverty. There's the old home that uh, we grew up in. We moved back here in 1932 into that house. And did you dream of big things? Yeah, I did. I was plying in a field right here, right out there one day, walking behind a pair of mules, and I saw a big, that was a dirt road that we came down, <clears throat> that it, it's paved now, but it was dirt then, and I saw a big Buick automobile go by, and I was walking barefooted behind that pair of mules, and I said to myself, someday, I'm gonna be riding in that car. And, uh, so, uh, no, no question what I, I want to do something other than walk barefooted behind a pair of mules, I'll tell you that. I know when I first borrowed $50,000 right after the war, in 1946, to build a radio station, my father heard about it, and he just kind of shook his head. He said, well, to, to the other boys who were still at home, he said, well, you know, he said, I don't know what I can do now. I said, Johnny's borrowed more money than I could ever help him pay for it real serious and uh, so uh, I think I think he obviously would have been proud of what I've been able to do and I think he'd be as disappointed uh, as he could be that I'm in this shape today but and it's kind of hard to believe the shape John Conley is in not the bankruptcy but the humiliation after all in the glory days Conley was more than just proud he was the real-life version of a widescreen Western star. Silver-haired, silver-tongued, tough, and a little dangerous. The Washington Post called him the best show in town. Don't let Ayatollah Khomeini and Leonid Brezhnev determine the political environment and the political future of America. No wonder presidents fell in love. Even Republican Richard Nixon made Democrat Conley his Treasury Secretary and wanted to make him vice president instead of Spiro Agnew. But GOP leaders said even if Connolly switched parties, he was too much of a gunslinger and too big a target. Eventually, Connolly did become a Republican, but his chance at the White House was thwarted at first by an indictment for bribery in the milk fund scandal. He was later acquitted. Finally, in 1980, with his wife Nellie, he ran for president. But even though he had the blessing of big business, and more money than any other candidate, his $12 million war chest bought him just one delegate, which he handed off to Ronald Reagan. You know, when we were all governors together, we had a, we had a nickname among ourselves for John, and uh, he sure has proven it was correct. <laughs> big John. <laughs> and he was big. How much at the end of the day do you sit around and think what might have been? Not ever. How close you were? What are the words, the saddest words? Of what, of my, a voice and pen of what might have been? You know, I don't worry about what might have been. But what are we to make of the way you have ridden the wheel of fortune? You're in the car in 1963 when John Kennedy is shot. You are wounded. You survive. You come back into a political career, you are this close to being anointed president. If Richard Nixon could have had his way, you would have been anointed president. And yet it slips away. The brass ring is always just out of reach. You run $12 million for one delegate. You end up in a trial for bribery for which you're acquitted. You end up in business, which ends up in calamity. Well, I think you have to take them one by one. Uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe the good Lord's got his hand on me. Uh, he certainly did uh, during the assassination. 
in Dallas in 63, riding in the back of that car, you had just turned to the president to say something to him. I said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you because we'd had tremendous crowds and, and the ovation for him was unbelievable and I was so excited. John was excited, we were pleased. You know, everything was going so well. And then the rifle shot. Then the shot. I looked right at the president because I was in the seat in front of Jackie. And I saw, saw him clutch his throat. And then, then I heard the second shot and John just collapsed. I pulled him down in my lap and, uh, you know, tried to cover him. It was, it was horrible. The whole thing was horrible. I thought I was going to die. And um, my whole life really flashed before my, my eyes, my mind's eye. And uh, strangely enough, uh, I was not unhappy with, uh, with what flashed uh, through my mind. And uh, when you have the brush with death that I had, you take an entirely different perspective on life and what's important and the priorities of life. And that's why we can, that's why we can go to the auction and sit there. Because this was part of our life. And uh, we were giving up part of our life. But that had to hurt. Well, sure it hurts. Of sure course it hurts. hurts. <laughs> but uh, again, we again had our health. We knew we could, we could rebuild our life. We knew we could do it all over again, and that's what I intend to do. And sold for $1,700. What Connolly told friends he intended to do when he left politics back in 1980 was make some money. I was worth, I don't know, six to ten million dollars. To most people, that's big rich. To me, it's not. At breakneck speed, he formed a partnership and parlayed that $6 million into $300 million by using the magic Connolly name to get short-term loans. He bought real estate, office buildings, condominiums, oil. He had 500 head of cattle, 100 horses, and auctions presided over by the big man himself. Then, suddenly, oil prices plummeted. No one wanted Texas real estate. The loans came due. The creditors moved in. And this room, was this emptied out? This is the morning room, and yes, it is, as you can see, there's a little bit of furniture in there. The rest of the room is, is all empty. Under Texas bankruptcy law, Connolly and Nellie forfeit 17,000 acres and four homes. They get to keep the big house, 200 acres, and $30,000 worth of furniture. Not enough to furnish the living room or salvage their pride. Is that the worst part, the pride? Sure, it's a blow to your pride. Of course it is. And, uh, but it's more than that. It's more than, than just a blow to your pride. It's, uh, it's realizing that you, that you failed in a project. It's realizing that you borrowed money that you can't repay. And that's a unique experience for me. I've never had that in my life. Uh, I've never owed anything I couldn't repay. And uh, that's a very humiliating, it's an embarrassing, it's a galling experience. And one that I'll never have but once. You run into investors on Wall Street and they say, ask him something for me. When I saw it, when I saw that the bottom was going to drop out of oil, or at least it was going to sag, how is it possible that the former Treasury Secretary, the former Governor, the businessman, the Texas businessman, didn't see it. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's hard to explain, I guess, why you didn't know something. Uh, the simple answer is, I didn't know it. But why go so fast? Why try to do well, condos we were, and spas think, and offices? I think the building? answer to it was that we were, we were riding a boom, uh, and we, we felt that uh, this wasn't going to last forever. We built 13 different apartment uh, projects and sold nearly all of them and made money on them. Uh, the things that we got hurt on were the Austin Real Estate, the Convention, the convention Center Spa and Country Club, on these uh, condominiums in South Padre, and uh, uh, the office building in Houston, 
and the condominiums in uh, Red Osa. That's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. So uh, it was a lot. We owe $48 million because of it. Were you stupid? No, I'm not stupid. Were you? No, I wasn't stupid. Not any more stupid than thousands of other people. If we were all stupid, we were, I guess we could be called that. No, I don't think it's stupid at all. How long has it been since you had an auction here? A couple of years. I can see we need a paint job before we have another one. You're gonna, you're gonna get cattle again? You're gonna auction again? No, I don't again? think so. I, I really don't. Uh, How much do you really have left? I mean, a lot of people assume you've got bank accounts squirreled away someplace. No, no. No, we do not. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got an income now of about six thousand a month, I guess, which is enough to uh, pay our bills and pay the utilities and things of that sort. Uh, keep what few hands we have here, but that's all we have. No private bank accounts no, with the little no, cushion. No, no. No private bank accounts and no horses in the Connolly stables. It's quiet there now except for the sound of wishful thinking. You know, one, of, one of my sad moments, really, is that Bunker Hunt has just dispersed uh, all his thoroughbreds. He had some of the best in the world. He had over 600 head. And uh, I would have I given anything if I'd had $100,000 to go over and invest in mares uh, that he owned. You are still a gambler. Well, you are. Yeah, I'm not, maybe, it's, maybe it's being a gambler, but, you know, I'm optimistic. Now, let me ask you about one more thing. I just want to play a couple of scenes for you, just to remember. I am proud and happy and Come humbled to say to you at this great gathering of the leaders of thought in this country that I am today announcing my candidacy for the Republican nomination for President of the United States. Thank you very much. a long time ago? Eons. Yeah. Eons yeah. ago. Do you still want to be president? No, I don't now. I wish I had been, uh, but there's a difference. I don't want to go through the travail of being elected. Uh, I was willing to do it once. I was eight years younger. Uh, I was unsuccessful, but I don't want to try it again. Uh, you know, at this point, you... Uh, I want to look elsewhere. I want to do other things. But the political reflexes are still intact. He told us he likes Bob Dole and thinks his old Texas rival George Bush may not be strong enough to be president. I ran against him in 1980. I, I think I'd make a better president than George Bush for, for one. But for now, Connolly's job is picking up the pieces. He says he'll write a book and work as a consultant until he makes enough money to pay off his creditors and buy back some of the things he lost at auction. That fellow from Vermont sent me $20. But money can't buy back time for a 71-year-old man. Okay. These days, the man who might have been president is out stumping for a local savings and loan. Nellie and I worked hard all our lives to make sure that our future would be financially secure. Well, the future's here. But things haven't worked out exactly as we'd planned. But that's all right, because there's no better place in Texas to start over and save a little something. Because you'd never know what the future might bring. University Savings. Your future starts here. He's been called the bad boy.